Michael is a really special individual who's accomplished something that very few people will ever do. He's translated the entire Bible from start to finish, and he's given it away for free to anyone who wants it. We also get to talk about some very high risk missionary work that he does. Um, it's a super interesting conversation. We cover a lot of different topics. Here's my talk with Michael. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. No problem. Why don't you start by telling me a little bit about the World English Bible um, and just, I guess, Bible copyright in general, because I became aware of y'all's project because I've been looking for a public domain Bible and I happened upon you guys. And I was really pleased to find you because not only is it a public domain Bible, which you can tell people about, but it, it's a it's a well done one. It, it's a it's a very readable Bible. Um, and we were really excited to find it. Well, uh, World English Bible. It started when I was, I just had it on my heart to come up with some digital Bible distribution. I was into electronic computer bulletin board hobby before the internet was a thing. This is like uh, before AOL. <laughs> way before AOL. Uh, this is, we're, we're talking ancient for a year. Okay. I, I kind of grew up with computers at a time when my first computer programming was done with punch tape on an electromechanical teletype terminal. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I'm not exactly a spring chicken here, but I recognize the value of digital Bible distribution and being able to read quickly with the Word of God and for people to be able to freely share and things because of the technology. Uh, making a copy of a digital file was a whole lot easier than printing a book. And um, so I, I had it on my heart to do that. And I had a copy of the King James Version of the Holy Bible on my computer bulletin board. But I thought, yeah, I'd like to distribute uh, something more modern. And it turns out that all the popular modern English Bible translations and even all the unpopular modern English Bible translations were copyrighted. And I couldn't get permission to use any of them. So I asked God what to do about this. He told me, you do that, almost audibly. I knew that anything the Lord asked me to do, I could do. You know, Peter can walk on water. I can do a Bible translation, right? Okay. So, so what God wants to do, it shall be done. So what, what year was this? That was in 1984. So this is, this is early. This is before Kindles. This is before any sort of, this is, oh yeah, this is early. So were there this any was before were, smartphones? This was, yeah. <laughs> were there any internet Bibles available at the time? Uh, the King James version was available at that time. And internet was kind of an experimental academia only thing. It wasn't, you know, you ask the average person what the internet was. They, they would not. So what did your process of translating the Bible look like um, is as far as starting it? So you get, are you going from the original Greek? Are you doing it from like a public domain English version? How, how did you translate it? Actually, I, there were, there were two starts to the project. The first one uh, resulted in what's now the God's living word translation, which you probably have never heard of. I was going from original languages to English with reference to other translations, you know, just to make sure I wasn't going off into some weird heresy or whatever. And um, that was slow. And I got through John at first, second, and third John and was starting on Revelation. And um, I extrapolated how much time it was taking me per verse and how long it would take to finish the whole Bible. And I said, Lord, I may not live to be 130 years old, uh, <laughs> which is what it would take at this rate. Is there a faster way? And so God showed me a faster way. And that's a related dialect adaptation of the American Standard Version of 1901 into modern English, using computers to accelerate the process. And that I did. Well, I guess let's take a step back. So, so most people aren't even aware of the copyright problem. Um, I'm, I'm only aware of it just because I, I, I run a Christian company and we ran into a similar problem where we were trying to use the Bible 
we wanted to put just a Bible to read in our app and we were having to go out and actually shop it. And it was a, a very different experience than what I anticipated when I was trying to <laughs> share the Bible with people. And it, um, we looked at trying to get a translation ourselves. We tried to, I mean, it, it's, it's a mess that most people are very unaware of. I was telling friends that you were coming on the program and, um, it was a totally new idea to them that somebody quote unquote owned the Bible. I was like, yeah, it's a big problem. It's, it's a problem for churches. It's a problem for missionaries. It's a problem for anybody that wants to make an, an interesting printing of the Bible. There's, there's the, all these different types of red tape. So what you were doing was trying to put a public, a, a Bible in the public domain. So it's freely available for anybody to print, anybody to download. That's, is that fair? Right. Okay. Yeah. Most of the people who realize there's a problem are the people who are involved in publishing, like a Bible study. Maybe they want to do a Bible study or a book that has a lot of scripture quoted in it. And you start trying to get permission from a Bible copyright owner. They start wanting to know, well, you know, just how orthodox are you compared to our beliefs? And, you know, all are we going to let you? And no, I don't think we're going to risk it. And oh yeah, here's what you know in royalties. And oh, there, there's, there's a bunch of cases of that. There is a couple of friends who wanted to minister to uh, Muslim background believers and to those who were going to be saved, shall we say, uh, out of Islamic religion. And they had the this copy of the Quran, and they put all kinds of footnotes in it with Bible quotes, extensive Bible quotes, saying how this related to that and where, where it agreed, where it disagreed, and all kinds of stuff. And uh, Bible publishers heard this, you know, mixing the Bible with the Quran. I don't want to touch that one. And they actually typeset and printed the thing and then got in trouble and, and had to pay royalties. They ended up redoing the thing with the World English Bible and then were able to print it. So, yeah, there, there's another friend of ours who wrote a book called Just Jesus, where she put in the front part of the book just the quotes of Jesus, just the red letters, or what's traditionally printed in red letters. And then she put this extensive index of what Jesus said about various things in it. And that's where her main value added came over just reading the bible this big index and stuff but the book was you know well over half just scripture quotes and to get permission from a traditional bible publisher to do that was a no-go by traditional bible publisher i mean you know not only thomas nelson and zondervan and uh all those guys but the american bible society and others like that no go. And then she found the World English Bible. We actually had a case, so I, I won't name names, but we reached out to a Bible publisher um, and we were going to do an entire audio Bible, um, highly produced. And I said, you guys can have it. Like, I, I just want the permission to do it. We'll put it up on our app. Y'all y'all can also use it. And um, they wouldn't agree to it, like an entire audio Bible. And then I and they said, We'll get, we'll potentially give you permission, but you have to pay royalties. And then on top of that, um, you have to turn over the entire thing once it's complete and then we'll up or down. Yes or no. If we'll do it at that point, it's like, well, I can't pay to have it done. And then you tell me no, after we've already completed the whole thing, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a strange problem and it feels, um, there's something it just feels like the antithesis of what the Bible should be. And it's this weird kind of red tape problem that has kind of come out of the, the modern, um, I guess, iteration of copyright, but it, it wasn't, it, it feels like it wouldn't have been there historically with, you know, the democratization of the printing press and all that sort of stuff. If historically you go way back to uh, Deuteronomy 17, 18, God commanded Kings of Israel to handwrite a copy of the Bible for, for themselves out of the copies before the priests. Okay. This is like the opposite of a copyright. This is, uh, a copy do. <laughs> this is, you should be copying is, it. Yeah. 
Uh, and then we look at the Great Commission, go and make disciples, teaching them everything I commanded you, Jesus said. Well, it's really tough to teach them everything he, Jesus has commanded without a copy of the Bible, don't you think? You could argue as to whether it's possible or not, but seriously, you're going to need Bible copies, and you're going to need to make audio copies and print copies and, and spread them around to obey the Great Commission. So there's that. That's the Christian side of it. That's, that's the God word side. That's what God himself says about his own word. Now, if you take the, um, the man word side, once the printing press was developed, there were attempts to say, well, you can't print anything unless it's licensed by the government or something like that. That eventually loosened up. But in the case of the Bible, one interesting little tidbit is that King James gave a perpetual exclusive printing right to the royal printers to print the King James Version of the Bible or the authorized version of the Bible and the uh, Book of Common Prayer only by the royal printers. And that was effective in England and Wales. And it's still effective in England and Wales. Really? That is still in effect. Really. That is crazy. So it's like a precursor to copyright that's still in effect or something that's in the public domain in the United States, but it still affects people if they want to print Bibles and import them into England or Wales or the UK in general. It's actually not a, an oppressive sort of thing. Permission is usually granted by the royal printers if they're convinced that the copyright is, or the, the copies are faithful copies. They're not milking it for money or anything like that, but it's that's like the precursor. But when the United States Constitution was drafted, it granted Congress the power to make limited time exclusive copy rights that would last for a certain amount of time, giving the author a, a guarantee of some income off of their creative works. And they've changed the law several times. So copyright law is some of the most confusing law in history because how long a copyright law lasts is so complicated that the simplest definition I found is on a Cornell Law website. And it's this huge page of all these ifs and when it was published and in what country and if copyright right was registered and renewed uh, or not. And now copyright law is, is simple but uh, oppressive in a way in that Copyright applies whether the author intends to or not. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah. If you were to write something that you want to spread widely, a sermon, a Bible study, a Bible translation, anything that you want to spread widely, the instant you write it down, it's copyrighted. And the copyright belongs to you, or if you did it for hire, to whoever hired you. And that copyright lasts for your lifetime plus 75 years or in the case of a corporate work for 95 years and so it locks up a lot of bible translations and because copyright is a legal monopoly designed to guarantee income it means that you can apply to bible translations the same rules you apply to fairy tales or whatever that you author today You've got the copyright for the rest of your life, plus probably a good portion of the life of your kids and grandkids, which is great for income generation, but not so great for evangelism. Yeah, it's funny. The, the Bible is not in the public domain, but Winnie the Pooh is, and that's uh, <laughs> an interesting problem to have. Well, actually, the Bible in the original languages is in the public domain. And some of the older translations are in the public domain. But once you make a translation that's new translation, that trans has a new So it was 1984 when you started the World English Bible using a related dialect translation. What what exactly is uh -huh. that? 94, actually. It was 1994. 94. Uh, okay. really? Yeah. I may have misspoke earlier. But uh, yeah. Related dialect adaptation. That's where you take 
basically archaic English and translate it to modern English. And the rules for the conversion are simple enough that you can do most of it with computer program. And I did. Think of it as like spell checking of uh, the American Standard Version. So it's almost like a find and replace type of deal. Yeah, kind of like that. Only a massive list of times and replaces. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did it take you to start from 1994? How long until you completed it? I got the first draft done in about three months. That's impressive. That's shocking. Got the rest of it done in about 36 years. <laughs> <laughs> the first draft it. was fast. That was, a, that was a good effort on the first draft. <laughs> that was the computer aided part. The rest was pretty manual. The checking against the original languages, the uh, insertion of quotation marks, the formatting poetry and prose properly. Well, the first draft was a little wooden sounding. It was usable. It was right. You could read it and it was scripture, but it wasn't really good modern English. I lost a little bit of the artistry of it. Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of checking, a lot of checking for typos, a lot of checking to see where the automation may have gone awry a little bit. And there are, were a couple of cases where it could have. And there's some things that I just had to stop and wait, what? Like the word caulkers. C-A-U-L-K-E-R-S. You know exactly what it means, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, I don't think I do, but <laughs> I was like, should I know what this word means? <laughs> I don't know. Well, it's a word found in the standard version of the uh, Holy Bible referring to those who repair seams in ships okay. with caulk. Interesting. That's, uh, yeah, that, that's something I'd have to look up on, on that one. Sometimes you have to use more than one word to replace a word to make sense. Uh, Did you go learn Greek and Hebrew uh, to do your spot check? Is that something you've learned since starting this project? Yeah, I, I use it with crutches. I have some digital crutches I use. Okay. And I actually had some genuine Bible scholars helping with the project. It wasn't all me. Part of the beauty of it was the, the uh, internet collaboration between a lot of people, more people than I can count. And it's like this global village check going on where people from all over the world who sent in suggestions and corrections and whatever. And it was like this massive flood of, of uh, suggestions coming in. It actually reminded me of um, Wikipedia, the way that you have it structured. Mm -hmm. it, it, it felt very much um, like a Wikipedia communal knowledge kind of effort, which I, I really uh, respect. But also, I think it's just if the the intention behind it feels right for the Bible, for your project, it just feels um it's attractive. There's something about it that's attractive, knowing that it is this communal effort to kind of share the word of, word of God with the world. I, I think it's a really neat project and experiment that you're doing. Um, but it's 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 really special. How many how many people did y'all have? Do you have any idea, a, a guesstimate on how many people y'all had work on it? I totally lost count. A part of it was any records I had early on of. Uh, how many people had contributed were lost in a disc crash. I, I've since become much more paranoid and, well, not paranoid, but careful in my uh, backup strategies. It is actually difficult to, instro to destroy Fort Dead on this project now. I mean, seriously, you could firebomb my house and the data would survive. Please don't do that. I, <laughs> I need a place to live, but... <laughs> How did your wife feel about you taking on, you, you uh, explained to her your new hobby was to translate the Bible. Was she on board for the project or was she was like, maybe yeah, pick I think up golf it, instead? I think it's better than bar hopping or something. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Are you guys, so y'all are missionaries by trade or has that kind of been something that y'all have done as uh, later in life or have y'all always been missionaries? Our life has come in phases. I mean, when I first got married, I was in the United States Navy as a, an officer serving on a nuclear powered submarine. Oh, really? And uh, I resigned, resigned that as soon as they would let me, which wasn't that soon, but um, because, you know, I, I wanted to come home and spend time with my wife rather than being sealed in a steel tube with a nuclear reactor out under the ocean somewhere. I also was sort of mission-minded then, too. I served as a lay chaplain on board the submarine. Then after that, I got a job as a software engineer and uh, worked uh, several different software engineering jobs before going into full-time missions. I got trained as a Bible translator, but did support work for Bible translation. Uh, we moved to Papua New Guinea, and we were there like eight and a half years total. And that was definitely different. I can imagine. So, you know, you know, I don't know how much of my understanding of, is it Papua? Is that technically correct? Papua New Guinea? Okay. Yeah. Yes. What I've seen has primarily been documentaries. And I don't know if they're salacious in nature compared to how it actually is, but it seems like um, tribal wouldn't do it justice. I mean, isn't there's over 100, 850 languages. There's tribes all over the place. Uh, tell me about your experience yeah. living there and your time as a missionary. Well, it took a while to get our uh, our visa. It made us late to our specific orientation course that we went to, but we just snuck in on that. Pacific orientation course is also referred to lovingly as jungle camp, <laughs> which is accurate. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, Anyway, after the Pacific Orientation course, we went to a mission base, Ukurumpa, which is the largest evangelical Christian mission base in the world. It's focused on Bible translation. Ukurumpa is in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, in the eastern highlands province. It's an interesting place. My wife, my wife taught in a school there, and my kids went to those schools. Uh, we went there with three sons and came back with an extra daughter we adopted while we were over there but while i was there i started this kind of a side job of uh, doing electronic scripture publishing by putting some of the papua new guinean bible translations up on a website and that's kind of an extension of what i did with the world english bible just expanded orders of magnitude more and you're trying to get into every uh individual dialect is that the the goal of the project as much as i can is it what are they dialects or is it or is it independent languages how much do they share in common between the languages of different tribes there's over 850 independent languages i mean the, okay so fully independent yeah like that's crazy a language versus a dialect different dialects are mutually intelligible like scottish english and texan english and maybe a little iffy there but you can understand both of them if you know English for, of your dialect. The languages and tribes, even tribes next to each other, are like as different as Chinese and French. Has that historically been the problem with m missionary work in Papua New Guinea? Is that it's that nobody can speak to each other? Yeah. And then when they can, it's in a trade language that people don't know as well. So it doesn't sink yeah. into their heart as well. Was there ever a concern for safety? Because, you know, online you hear about cannibalism, uh, head hunting tribes. Is there still a level of that level of aggression or has that kind of faded? Because I know that, that missionaries, at least through the early uh, 1900s, had issues with some of the tribes. Is that Was there a concern um, with the w going out and meeting new tribes or a concern for your family? The short answer is yes. <laughs> the longer answer is <laughs> there, there has been some improvement in areas where the gospel has been longer. 
but we don't go there to share the gospel with people because they aren't ready act, acting like Christians. Theft, murder, sorcery, all these things are problems. Highway robbery is not just an expression there. It happens. It's dangerous. Is there any government involvement at all, or is it primarily gang-oriented, or, or is there not even that level of, of uh, order? You're used to having a competent government with a, an efficient police force that uh, is not corrupt and is not easily swayed by the bad guys. It's nice. I, I appreciate getting back to that when I left there. They try in Papua New Guinea, and they have some police, but in some areas of the country, the police are outgunned, outmanned, and outsmarted by the bad guys. Uh, Wild West is a term that comes to mind. We relied mostly on divine protection. Uh, Why Papua New Guinea as opposed to, I don't know, it seems like there's lots of countries that don't have uh, cannibalism as as a a thing that occurs. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we... We both agreed that that's where God was calling it, so we went. The safest place on the planet to be is where God calls you to be. I mean, you can go to Chicago and get killed, and you could be killed on the highway anywhere in the United States, dead one way or dead the other, and still dead. Now, the, the safest place to be is wherever God wants you to be. But there were times when the threat was more real than others and when it was distressing. Tribal war kind of broke out around us a time or two. Uh, there was an attempt by armed robbers to rob us one time when we were on the stair road between Okarumpa and Pinantu. I was in a Toyota Hilux diesel powered twin cab short bed pickup truck, kind of old, but reliable. And I had a cover on the back and a couple bench seats and had my sons in the back. And, uh, this guy stepped out on the road with a gun and another guy with a big bush knife and machete trying to get us to stop. I thought, well, that's not a very smart idea. Did you stop? <laughs> no, I lowered the car, aimed straight at the guys with no, no sign of slowing down, which took them aback. They didn't expect that. I stepped back, the guy with the machete raised up like this, and it was like a, an invisible hand stopped him, and we passed by quickly and around the corner and by that time you know i was too busy to be scared till we were around the corner and then once i was around the corner there's no point in being scared man that's a uh that's a, a different a different level of trust that's uh that's true trust that's a physical safety trust of course <laughs> do you know how many bibles that you have had, had downloaded to date i guess world English encompassing um, additional language translations that are kind of modeled on that? Well, I don't know about modeled on the world English Bible, but there's a a page. My computer keeps track of this for me. Uh, Let's see. 191,477,664 so far. That's amazing. It's, uh, that's it's a shocking number of, of people using your Bible that has to have some level of satisfaction. I mean, that's just as, as a project. I mean, that's an amazing return on, on time spent. It is. I mean, the, that's one advantage of the digital Bible distribution over print distribution. If I were to be mailing Bibles, printed Bibles, think of the cost just in shipping alone, let alone a printing, let alone figuring out which Bibles and which languages to go where, and then shipping them randomly. No, with the internet, people find what they want and download that. So it, it's much more efficient at reaching people at that scale. And the cost for Bible is much lower. Is the bulk of your uh, translation work into other langu- languages um, in Papua New Guinea, or is it? do you distribute in other countries as well? The Americas would be number one, then Europe, then Asia, than the Pacific, than Africa by count. But you got to consider that uh, impact on the Pacific is probably higher 
as a proportion of the number number of people there and as a proportion of the uh of each language group reached because i have actually a lot of deliveries of small language groups you know a couple thousand people may be the size of the language group altogether and a significant number of deliveries in that language group may only be a thousand or a thousand five hundred but for a language group of two thousand i call that significant Mm -hmm. just in terms of the proportional as a percentage reach for those people right god loves all the people regardless of the language they speak no matter what size their language group is do you do you prefer to focus on those smaller language groups as far as your contribution that's kind of my main focus is the the small language groups the language groups in uh creative access countries and the uh and the people who are just not yet convinced of the value of the Holy Bible and therefore unlikely to go pay for a copy, but they know I read a free copy if they can find it. So what do you mean by creative access countries? That's where you have to be creative to access it because there might be local laws of man that are contrary to God's laws. There may be some other religion or atheist groups who are uh, persecuting people who are reading or following the Holy Bible. What what countries are you in that require creative access in terms of d- distribution? Most of them. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so that would, that would encompass all of Papua New Guinea, all most of the villages there? That's not so much a creative access in terms of uh, persecution. That's a creative access in terms of technology because internet is sparse there and expensive, but there are some creative things that we do. There are uh, little boxes about this big that provide an internet hotspot that doesn't actually go to the internet. It just goes to a local server and provides access to Bible downloads. And you can go around to various places with those. MAF does that. SIL does that. They, they have these little Bible boxes or uh, know about God boxes, they call them. Is there any risk that if somebody was found with a box like that, that that would have the same potential um, danger to them as, as being caught with a Bible? In Papua New Guinea, there is really no danger in getting caught with a Bible. In North Korea, yeah, you could be killed. Do y'all, y'all work with people in North Korea? Uh I can't confirm or deny that. Do you all work with insurgent missionary people in, in countries like that? Yeah. Is there anything that you can share in terms, not, not specifically that, but just in general? <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I, I'm not going to give specifics on a podcast. I'm just going to say that we're, we're reaching out wherever we can and that um, there are places we go that are very hard for the government to censor or control the levels of control differ significantly like uh there's some countries that just try to regulate christianity and say okay you can only use this approved bible translation and you can't sell it except through officially registered churches or something and there are others that say what? No, keep that out of here. It's blasphemy. Or uh, there are others that say any religion we don't want because they're officially atheist. Or there's another one where they want the official religion to be something that is another world religion. And that's what the government wants everybody to be. And so they discourage everything else. And that discouragement may be active persecution uh, of various sorts. I'm assuming that the governments in these countries have have uh, state-run internet service providers. So are you encrypting files? Are you uh, providing any sort of software masking to, to what they're downloading to, pro- to protect them? Or how does that work? Do you all just work with individuals to distribute that independent of ISPs or, or whatever it may be? It's, it's a mix. Cryptography, virtual private networks, all these things can come into play. All the things that make it hard for censorship. And some countries, they don't actually try to 100% stop the Bible from coming in. They just 
want to make it hard to get to and hope that most people will ignore it and keep it down to a low roar. That's interesting. There, there are ways to get scriptures in there. We have a few downloads uh, in China, and I think it's because our app is registered as a health app and not under religion because it's meditation. So I think <laughs> I think we snuck through the the filters there, which is interesting. I was surprised when we saw that, but that's that's um, that's amazing work. That's very. Do you feel any personal risk there, or is it purely? Um, do you feel no risk just because it's it's not directly connected to you? I mean, I have to imagine that some people aren't thrilled about what you're doing. There are some places that I probably should not travel to uh, for safety reasons. But uh, when I'm sitting here on U.S. soil that's surrounded by the Pacific Ocean, I feel like I'm in a castle with a very large moat. Uh, <laughs> and... I, I can, with impunity, post Bibles to my heart's content. Um, last year, about this time, there was a huge surge in a certain area of Asia, Asia and downloads. And since I was traveling at the time and trying to access my computers in my office remotely to see what was going on, but couldn't, I, I found out when I got back, it was all working. It was just overloaded. It just couldn't respond because it was overloaded, but the Bibles were going out. It was like this huge surge of a certain uh, of Bible translations downloaded in a certain persecuted group in Asia, which either there were a lot of people suddenly interested in that group downloading, or it was the, their government trying to do a denial of service attack by oh, man. I guess first you uh, you should probably explain what what a DDoS attack is, and then you can uh, tell me if you've had other attacks of that sort. Uh, DDoS or denial of service attack is where somebody floods your server with a whole bunch of junk requests, usually from different IP addresses coming in from uh, bots that are compromised machines that they've taken over with malware. And the objective is to take down your site. It, it can happen. I, I've i gotten several requests in the last couple of weeks uh, to offer me attack services to take down competitors' websites. Oh, really? Yeah. For uh, a mere 2,000 rubles, they'll attack anybody you want. That's crazy. And... <laughs> Yeah, I, I've had attacks, but do you think it's primarily um, governments, or do you think it's it's hacking groups, or, or? it's hard to tell? Um, mainly, the response is the same, regardless of who's done it. So uh, I've just strengthened my sites and uh, strengthened the security every time to make sure that the same kind of attack doesn't work. So if they're going to attack again, they got to try something different or try a, a stronger version. Well, Michael, I, uh, I I appreciate what you're doing. We we believe in it. Um, we're going to try to help you guys out as much as we can. I'm going to write some blog posts. And, and I um, I appreciate you coming on the show. But this, this is amazing. I have the Bible here. I ordered one of the few physical copies that are available. But it is the <laughs> World English Bible. I believe in y'all's mission. Um, it, it really is. It's a it's a beautiful Bible. Y'all did a good job. It's very readable. I've been waiting for it for a long time. And I think what you all are doing is amazing. Um, I really do believe in what you guys are doing, and I appreciate you taking the time to, to talk to me. Well, thank you. And glory be to God who enables us to do all the good things. Absolutely. Why don't, why don't you tell us um, the best way to contact you and the best way to find out about your site? Do you do any fundraising? Oh, yeah. Uh, to find out more about me and my ministry, mljohnson.org. mljohnson.org is the kind of our missionary information URL, and it's got contact information on there. Do you prefer people to download the Bible from your site, or do you, if they want to support you financially, do they buy the book um, through Amazon, or do you prefer donations? Is there ways that people can support what you're doing? 
I prefer the donations, actually. Uh, I get a, a teeny tiny bit uh, of money from the, the sales on Amazon.com, but it's it's not significant, honestly. But if the objective is just to support the ministry, then, yeah, just, just send money, and it'll help get the Bible to other people. It's like public radio. You know, a few people pay, so a lot of people get to hear. All right, Michael, I appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we will be in touch, but I, I, I um, encourage everybody to go get the Bible, support the the ministry, the movement. It is due time that there is a, a really well done public domain Bible, and I encourage everybody to go download it. Sounds good. God bless you. The English Bible on our website. And if you're interested in supporting this show, you can subscribe here on YouTube, or you can go and check out our website and mobile app, Hope, Mindfulness, and Prayer, which is available in the Apple and Google Play app stores.